Yeah, this is a lecture. So everybody should have their notebooks open. We are gonna get started in just a second. I need our voices in this back corner to stop. So we've looked at the causes of the Civil War. We have looked at the Civil War and now we need to figure out what is happening after the Civil War. We just had 11 states of the United States completely remove themselves politically, socially from the United States. And now they're gonna be brought back in. How are we going to do this? How is this going to uh, push the country forward? Especially considering the South does not like the North. They do not like the priority of ending slavery. They do not like any of these things. So how are we gonna bring them back into the country while also holding on to like the values that we should be putting forward in reconstruction? Yes, Jose. Yes. So today, we are going to look at civil, uh, the end of the Civil War and Reconstruction. So you guys should put Civil War and Reconstruction at the top of your page with the dates 1865 to 1877. These are often considered the formal years of Reconstruction. And does everybody have the title up? Okay. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. So first let's consider what is So as the Civil War is coming to an end, Lincoln, along with his main advisors, are trying to figure out how are we going to readmit these states, especially in the, uh, at the end of 1864 to 1865. Union victory is at that point inevitable. It's just a matter of when. So they are trying to figure out how are we going to readmit these, um, these new states. So because we had never had secession, the Constitution did not give Lincoln or anybody an outline of what they should be doing. So they were all doing this based off of what they felt was right. And Lincoln had what we call the 10% plan. Okay. Uh, yes, there we go. And the 10% plan had two pieces to it. The two pieces of the 10% plan are, one are if the, the states are allowed to come back into the union, if one, they take an oath of loyalty to the country. So again, the first part of the 10% plan is a state needs to take an oath of allegiance to the country. So they have to take an oath of allegiance. And the second thing, they need to abolish slavery. They need to adapt the 13th Amendment or adopt the 13th Amendment, I apologize. This is Lincoln's plan and it is called lenient by a lot of members of Congress. So a lot of people in Congress don't think that this plan is far, goes far enough. They don't think that it punishes the South enough for what they did. Specifically, the main group that criticizes Lincoln is the radical Republicans.
So again, the main critiques of Lincoln are the radical Republicans. Now, radical Republicans do not just believe in abolishing slavery, they also believe in racial equality. So again, it's for them, it's not enough to stop at ending slavery. They want to do their best to preserve or ensure racial equality. They are led by this man named Thaddeus Stevens. Uh, Thaddeus Stevens is a great person, so let's not make fun of his name. Thaddeus Stevens. Thaddeus Stevens is a congressman from Pennsylvania. And he, alongside the radical Republicans, proposed the Wade Davis bill. The Wade Davis bill includes a lot more punishment for Southern leaders. So again, the Wade Davis bill includes punishment for Southern leaders. It also provides more support to freedmen in the South. Thaddeus Stevens, uh, just as a side note, he's somebody that if we had more time, I would like to go into more detail. You don't have to write this down, but Thaddeus Stevens is actually married to a black woman at this time, but they can't legally be married. Um, so it's something that is like not officially, con it's one of those things where historians basically know it's true, but we don't have any explicit written documentation, but he has, um, he has a maid that is actually basically his common law wife. They legally cannot get married. And there were, it was very scandalous in Washington, DC, because everybody's like, hmm, that looks a little sus. But he is, um, if you guys have ever seen the movie Lincoln, I'll say, if you guys have ever seen the movie Lincoln, Thaddeus Stevens is in this movie and you actually see him um, with his wife and she's reading the 13th Amendment to him and it's really, really sweet. Okay, but so these, uh, yes, Jose, what is your question? Yes, so this is when we start to see the formation, like at this point, Democratic, Democrats and Republicans are the only two main political parties we are gonna be studying. But once we get closer to uh, the Great Depression is when we're gonna start seeing that switch of like the Democrats and the Republicans as we know them today. Okay, so those are the two initial plans for reconstruction. I'm going to keep talking and if you miss the information then you miss the information, but we have to get this through this whole lecture today. So if I see you talking, you ask me to repeat something, I will not. You can go back to the lecture video that you will see on Google Classroom. So death of a vision, as we know, Neither of these plans become a reality because on April 14th, 1865, Lincoln is assassinated. So again, Lincoln is assassinated on April 14th, less than a week after the surrender at Appomattox. Eighteen sixty-five. He is assassinated by a man named John Wilkes Booth. John Wilkes Booth is a Confederate sympathizer and he's an actor. He is a very famous man in the United States at this time. It's actually very, very like crazy. Yeah, like he's a famous actor before he assassinates Lincoln. It would be the equivalent, like who's a famous B-list actor who's like a little past their prime, but like. Mark and Mark. Will Smith, that's an interesting choice. Polanyi's going to get laughed out of the room. Okay, no, but that's basically what it is. So he is an actor that is past his prime, but he's still extraordinarily famous. 
So it's just this national scandal that you have this really famous actor that's assassinating the president of the United States. So the goal of uh, John Wilkes Booth and the, and the fellow conspirators, their goal is, it, is not just to kill Lincoln. They actually attempt, um, they attempt the assassination of um, William Seward, who is Lincoln's uh, secretary of state. And is it Grant? I can't remember who the third person is, but their goal is to like knock out the three or four most famous union Northern men out. So that way it would throw the union into chaos and then the Southerners would be able to re-secede. But he was the only one that was actually able to assassinate the person that they were supposed to assassinate. But William Seward is absolutely maimed. It's really, really bad. Um, anyways, okay. So he's assassinated. So all plans that they originally had for, for reconstruction are basically destroyed. Once again, guys, I'm getting a lot of emails. Okay, that's better. Okay, so Lincoln's assassinated. And now Andrew Johnson, this, ugh, um, this guy becomes the president. Okay. So Johnson becomes the president. And the interesting thing about Johnson, he is a Democrat. So he was chosen by Lincoln's associates to be his running mate because they wanted to get more Northern Democrats to vote for him in the 1864 election. So Johnson's a Democrat. That's the only part that you need written down. <laughs> so Johnson is a Democrat. He's also a Southerner and a former slave owner. <laughs> I'll say, how do we think reconstruction is gonna go now with this guy in charge? And so, and so he has a completely di different vision of what reconstruction should be. He gives amnesty to all Southerners, except high ranking officials, which basically means if you are from the South and let's say you're, I think it's anything below a general, you get off scot-free. Like you commit treason and you are given zero punishment. Mm -hmm. Okay, not a fun fact. I don't, this is an unfun fact. Only one person, only one person is actually executed for treason after the Civil War. Um, he is actually, oh, what is his name? He's white. I'm, lo I'm, losing, I'm losing his name. You don't have to write this down. But the only person that is actually executed for, uh, for treason He's the leader of a prisoner, a prisoner of war, war camp called Andersonville. And so the only reason why he was assassinated is because of the, I need the side conversations to stop, please. The only reason why he is executed is because of the treatment that he gave prisoners of war. So Lee gets off with no prison time. Jefferson Davis gets off with no prison time. It's like they commit treason and they are treated just fine. And because uh, when, oh, Ariel is already back. There you go. So, so because of this with the elected officials, they get to go back to the South and do basically whatever they want. How do we think that's gonna go? So now that you have all of these racist former enslavers that are maintaining the South, we start to see the creation of something called black coats. Now, black codes are laws that restrict the rights of African-Americans in the South. We finish at 10.15, right? Okay, good, we have plenty of time. 10.05, oh no. Okay, we gotta, we gotta speed up. I need to stop getting on tangents. Okay, so. Black codes are just laws that restrict the rights of African-Americans. And we are gonna go into more detail about those in a few slides. Now, it's not all bad, but there are definitely things that are happening in the South that lead it reconstruction at first to being a failure. In 1865, after the war is over, the radical Republicans create the Freedmen's Bureau.
Now the Freedmen's Bureau is an organization And the goal is basically to help former enslaved people assimilate into like just regular society. So again, their goal is to help um, African-Americans in the South assimilate into Southern society. This is through, so they provide things like clothing, food, education's a big one. And they also do their best to give them access to land so they can start their own farms. <laughs> Thank you. In response to this, Southern plantation owners set up a system known as share. <laughs> Now sharecropping is a system where former slave owners would rent out their land to African-Americans for a share of the crops that they grew. So again, former enslavers are renting their land to former enslaved people, so to African-Americans, who have to give them a share of the crops that they're growing. And what does that sound like? Sounds a lot like sleep. Okay. Uh, do we all have the definition for sharecropping? Okay. So now let's look at the political side of reconstruction. because it's a political cartoon. So they're making fun of them. Oh, we're getting to the political cartoon part of the, of the class. So the first main piece of legislation that is under contention between the Congress and president is the Civil Rights Bill or the Civil Rights Act. The Civil Rights Bill is passed in, uh, can you give a one? Oh, so, oh, you had a question? Oh, never mind, sorry. All right, so the Civil Rights Act is signed in 1866. And the Civil Rights Act was deeply contested by Andrew Johnson. Andrew Johnson does not like the Civil Rights Act. He actually vetoes it, and the House of Representatives it actually has to overturn his veto in order for it to pass. Andrew Johnson. Uh, yes, Alondra. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't, so it's, it does make sense, it's a bill until it's passed and then it becomes a law or an act. But we go into that more next year. <laughs> right. hmm? Gov is very different. Okay, next we have the 14th Amendment. So the next thing that comes after the Civil Rights Act is the 14th Amendment. Now the 14th Amendment guarantees And this is very, very specific. The 14th Amendment guarantees equal protection under the law. So again, the 14th Amendment guarantees equal protection under the law for anyone born in the United States, regardless of race.
So the 13th Amendment ends slavery, but the 14th Amendment is what guarantees Black citizens their civil rights. And so now that we have these two major portions of uh, legislation, it's 1867 and Re Republicans realize that these laws will not be followed in the South if they do not help. So in 1867, Congress sends uh, troops down to the South to protect the freedom of these um, African-Americans. So again, the American military is going into the South to ensure that African-Americans are able to practice these rights like voting. There are also a lot of other people that are going down to help. The first is a group that will get the, uh, the nickname of carpetbaggers. And I say nickname, but it's honestly, if this makes sense, it is a very derogatory term that is used at this time that is still employed today. So I know carpetbaggers sounds very silly. It's specifically in reference to the fact that they have suitcases made of carpet because um, that's how suitcases were made of back then. So carpetbaggers are Northern people. So carpetbaggers are Northern people that move to the South to help these freedmen through either education, jobs, whatever that might be. So again, these are Northerners that are relocating to the South to help them assimilate. And this is a term that I, that I was called like two years ago. No, when I was still, when I was still living in Virginia, this, this term was used against me quite a bit. Mm -mm. I don't cry if a racist calls me a bad name. No, I mean, so, so Southerners are very, are still very protective of civil war history. And so, because I argue that the Confederacy is bad, I had a lot of, had a lot of men call me a carpetbagger and I got over it very quickly. Yeah. Okay. Now the next, now the next, uh, the next term that is used against people at this time is scalawags. I know these are silly derogatory norms, names now, but it's important to know that at the time it was a very, very derogatory term. This was not, this is, it wasn't silly when you were called any of these things. So a scalawag, a scalawag is a southerner who supports the North after the Civil War. So if you're living in the South and you're like, you know what? Yeah, slavery is bad. We should start assimilating freedmen back into society. Like this is what we should be doing. You would be called like basically a traitor or a scalawag. Okay. So under Andrew Johnson, reconstruction is very slow and it's not very effective. But we start to see some change when we get a new president. So, no, it is not Washington. So as we discussed, President Johnson, as I said, I'm going to keep talking. So President Johnson is very, very disliked uh, by most Republicans in the North. And he's also extraordinarily not good at his job. And he actually ends up, uh, he actually ends up being impeached. So Andrew Johnson is impeached in 1867. So Andrew Johnson is impeached in 1867. And he is only saved from being removed from office by one vote. <laughs> one vote keeps him in office. 
But obviously, as we are approaching the 1868 election, do we think Andrew Johnson has a chance? No. no. So, President uh, General Grant, that you guys might remember from the Civil War, he becomes president in 1868. So Grant is uh, becomes president in 1868, and Reconstruction is at its most successful when Grant is president. And the first major um, accomplishment in Grant's presidency is the passage of the 15th Amendment. Now the 15th Amendment protects the right to vote for all men, regardless of race. Uh, that comes later. Got, women have to wait another 60 years. So the 15th Amendment gives all men the right to vote regardless of race. Okay. Just as a heads up for AP exam, IA, all of those things, you will need to know the differences between the 13th through the 15th Amendment. So just as a heads up, make sure you, you know, 13 abolishes slavery, 14 guarantees civil rights, 15 right to vote. So now, what are some other gains that comes through President Grant's, uh, during President uh, Grant's presidency? So the first major gain is we have our, the very first Black men in Congress. So the first Black men are elected into Congress in the 1800s, I mean, in the 1870s. Um, I'm, I'm going to go through their names, but you don't have to write them down because it's a lot. But it's important that we know their names. Um, Hiram Revels is the first African American um, elected to the Senate. And he's elected in Mississippi. Like, that's pretty incredible. Yes, we'll talk about that more and when we get up to the 20th century. Okay, so we have these changes. So we have the 15th Amendment. We have uh, Black men being elected to Congress, but that is going to be short-lived. So Southerners are extremely, extremely upset that they are being forced to follow these rules. And so for them, the best way to suppress these rights is through violence. Yeah. So uh, the first group, the first group that emerges out of the South as a, um, as a domestic terrorist group, and I, that's what I call the Redeemers and the KKK is they are domestic terrorists. Um, the, rede uh, the Redeemers are their first group. And their goal is to remove all radical Republicans and quote unquote, redeem the South. Next, uh, the Ku Klux Klan is founded in 1865, immediately after the Civil War ends, by a former Confederate general. So again, the KKK is, uh, it stands for the Ku Klux Klan. It's founded in 1865, almost immediately after the end of the Civil War. And it's founded by a former uh, Confederate general, which is why you punish generals who commit treason. Andrew Johnson. Mm -hmm. So 
Um, during Andrew Johnson's presidency, the KKK is very easy. It very easily controls the South. They're, they go a little bit more underground during Grant's presidency. But as Grant's presidency is coming to an end, uh, things are not looking good. So as the Democrats are gaining more control in these former Confederate states, the election of 1877 begins. And there is a big, big debate over the electoral college vote. I don't know if you guys can see those votes, but literally the Republican gets 185 and the Democrat gets 184. That's gonna be a contentious election. And so they decide to make a compromise and how do compromises go as far as we know, pretty badly. So the Democrats and the Republicans make the compromise of 1877. In the compromise of 1877, the Democrats allow Rutherford B. Hayes to become president. He's a Republican. <laughs> So Rutherford B. Hayes becomes, pre so that's the first part of the compromise. Rutherford B. Hayes becomes president. And in exchange for him becoming president, the federal government will remove the troops from the South. Hmm? You're, we're gonna talk about that. And so do we think that reconstruction is going to progress positively if there are no troops there to ensure it? So, the re so 1877 is often considered the end of reconstruction because of this compromise. So again, the end of reconstruction is often marked with this compromise. So while there are still efforts at reconstruction in certain parts, effectively it's over. Which brings us to the new reality for freedmen in the South, the, the Jim Crow South. Just to name for you guys, during this time in our lessons, we are gonna see a lot of honestly upsetting images because of the type of uh, political cartoons that were made at this time. Uh, the one on the screen is just an example. So I do just want to name for you guys that as like we are approaching this era with a lot of political cartoons and different things, it is going to be very upsetting. So I just want you guys to know. I know that personally they bother me, but um, they're, they're still important to see because it tells us what was happening at the time. So this is when basically all of the effective, effectiveness of the 14th Amendment goes away. As we see the creation of Jim Crow laws, which is basically segregation. So segregation, we can also call those Jim Crow laws. And they really start appearing after the Compromise of 1877. So they begin after the Compromise of 1877 and by 1900, they dominate the South. Uh, segregation is, normal in the South by 1900. And alongside segregation, Southerners are in adamant that they do not want freedmen to get any type of political power. And they ultimately do that by attacking their right to vote with different voting restrictions. Also as a heads up, after this slide, we have one more and then we're done. Uh, this one has a few more key terms when we go over. So there are three types of voting restrictions that were most common in the South. The first is called a poll tax. 
it's not spelled like that. It's P O L L space tax. It's a poll tax. So a poll tax is you have to pay to vote. And how many freedmen do you think had excess money to be able to do that? So that was specifically targeted at black men. So again, poll taxes, you pay to vote. The second are literacy tests. Hmm? So literacy tests are tests that prove that you can read and write. So literacy tests are tests that prove that you can read and write, but they are extraordinarily difficult. As in, I have a master's degree and I still have not passed a literacy test from this era. I'm gonna see if I can find one to show you guys tomorrow because we have a little extra time in class tomorrow, but that's what I mean. Like they are, in, the goal is for them to be impossible to pass and they only are given to black people. And finally, we have the grandfather clause. It's the grandfather clause. Yes, the grandfather clause. So the grandfather clause declared that men whose grandfather couldn't, couldn't vote cannot vote. So again, it says that men whose grandfathers could not vote, could not vote. It to stop black people from voting. Okay, so. So. All of that to say, that's all really important, but what's more important is the generations of black people in the South that resist Jim Crow. So that's why we're gonna end with them because it's important that we spotlight them. Throughout this entire time, you have a group of black, uh, of black people and, white, and some white allies who are working to fight against the Jim Crow South. Some of these efforts are successful and some of them aren't. The first that we need to know is Plessy versus Ferguson. You guys have probably uh, heard of this court case before. Plessy versus Ferguson is in 18, 1883. Mm -hmm. So again, Plessy versus Ferguson is in 1883. And Plessy is a black man pictured right here, who argued that the, huh? Mm -hmm. According, according to, according to Jim Crow, literally they said, if you have a, if you have one drop of non-white blood, you are black. He has literally, it. so even though he is what, for lack of a better word, like white passing, he was still considered black. So, so in 1883, Plessy argues against, uh, Homer Plessy argues against the segregation of the railroad. So again, he argues, he argues that the segregation of the railroad is unconstitutional. However, the Supreme Court rules against him. So again, the Supreme Court rules against him, which means that with Plessy's versus Ferguson, segregation becomes constitutional. So again, the biggest impact of Plessy versus Ferguson is segregation is now considered constitutional. Mm -hmm. 
And with this, conditions for uh, Blacks in the South continues to deteriorate. But this is where we also step, start to see um, a new generation of civil rights leaders. You have uh, men like Booker T. Washington, He's really complicated. <laughs> I would love to talk to you more about Booker T. Washington. It's very, he, he's very, he's very interesting. So, hmm? so Booker T. Washington uh, supports legal cases against segregation. So he tries to help people fight against segregation. He's also the founder of some of the first HBCUs. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it sounds for uh, historically black colleges and universities. He's the founder of some of the first ones. And so he believes, he believes that through education, black people can assimilate. So you need to be educated if you want segregation to be over. He's very, very complicated. Two more key terms. Next, we have W.E.B. Du Bois, who is in the bottom right right here. Uh, W.E.B. Du Bois. So literally, W.E.B. and then Du Bois is up there. And he is often considered, quote unquote, the more radical between him and Booker T. Washington, he argues that you should never allow oppression or accept inferiority. So he is a, he is a very loud, adamant uh, speaker against uh, segregation. Yes. So if this makes sense, Booker T. Washington is like a pick your battles type of guy and W.E.B. Du Bois is like, there are like every battle is important. Does that make sense? They're a lot more complicated than that, but that's like the simplest. All right, and then finally we have Ida, um, Ida B. Wells, who is in that, in that top right. Um, Ida B. Wells is a, is a journalist and she specifically wrote about the issue of lynchings in the South. So that is Ida B. Wells. Again, she is a journalist. And she specifically speaks against lynchings. Um, Ida, I-D-A. Oh, lynchings. Uh, lynchings is L-Y-N-C-H-I-N-G-S. Yes, we're gonna talk about her with milkbreakers. All right, and then finally, we just need to know that this is, that the NAACP is founded in 1909. And this is a group that is specifically fighting for African-Americans against inequality. Hmm? Uh, 1909. Okay, once you guys are done, uh, don't worry about the exit ticket, but you guys may go.